Hi, welcome to, to, to Next Normal. And today is a very special day because um, I'm an old sneakerhead. We just talked about it. So I, I love my old Slam magazine uh, kicks issues. And I was always inspired by the design process of the basketball shoes. That's when I got to love how shoes are done. And it's therefore my, my big pleasure to have Michael here as a special guest today. So let's go shoes today. So Michael, I hand over for, for a quick intro to you and we'll probably have difficulties stopping on time today because we, we can talk for, for hours, uh, in my opinion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I could definitely see that. So like, like I said, my name is Mike or Michael and my wife and I are the founders of a company called EDL Evolution Design Lab is like the full name EDL in short. So it's, it's pretty simple and easy. And then we are a fashion footwear manufacturer, distributor, brand company. And so what we do is we handle the concept, the design, the manufacturing, we do the import and distribution for our for women's footwear. So we do a variety of different types of business models, but our primary brand is Jelly Pop. We also work with different retailers to actually create a brand exclusive to them. And then we also do OEM as well. And so we have three primary different business models in itself. And, and that's the very interesting part in, in this um, show, because we don't, we look from a retail perspective, but in the end, we look out of a brand perspective and we also look out of a supply chain perspective. And um, as I know, you're, you're a tech head, so you, yep. you're really very much into technology and how to really optimize that flow. And uh, <laughs> maybe if we, if we start from the beginning, so if, you, if there is an idea, if there's a part, you, you do a sample or, I mean, that's where it starts or you do a design and, and how, how is that happening? Um, on a, let's say, on a technological view side? So, uh, you know, the more and more I thought about it, sorry to kind of do a, a random pivot, but I, I, I figure it's probably best to kind of give you a little background information about myself and also my wife and how the company got started. So it'll give you a better idea how we got from there to here. So uh, my, I, I grew up programming. And out of high school, I was really fortunate. After I came out of high school, I was recruited by Disney um, Disney Consumer Products actually to start working on 3D and de-rendering. And they had worked with this little company you might have heard of called Pixar. And what a lot never, of people never don't, heard of that one. Never, never heard, heard of, of Pixar, of right? <laughs> and the, the funny thing is what a lot of people don't know is that Pixar originally was not a movie company. They were a hardware and software company that Steve Jobs bought out of George, from George Lucas because George Lucas had a divorce. And so during that time frame, as George Lucas was selling off all the things that they used to make Star Wars from the Lucas Ranch, the hardware software for special effects was kind of spun out and Steve Jobs wanted to sell that. Disney was one of the big customers for all this technology. And they used to make a lot of short films. And John Lasseter was so talented at making it that they ended up doing this entire um, movie deal. And it began with, with Toy Story. Mm -hmm. I started working at Disney using the RenderMan software. And the RenderMan software, my job was actually the exact opposite. As animators made the movies through animation, I would work on de-rendering them and putting it into a big, large Oracle asset management database so licensees could see 3D models and actually produce consumer products behind it. Fast forward a couple years later, I, I met my wife and her family had a shoe company. And so I kind of tell this as a story of rather than beauty and the beast, I'd say it's, it's beauty and the geek. So I'm the geek, she's the beauty, and she's handling all the design and development side. And that was kind of her family business. And so along the way, I started taking a lot of the information, knowledge that I had from Disney, from a big, large enter global enterprise company and developing a lot of consumer product and applied a lot of the business management standpoint and technology back into our shoe company side. And so as things were kind of progressing and time progressed, I worked more on the technology stack for, I don't know, eight to 10 years, roughly, give or take, before my wife and I basically took over the business and where we started our own business completely separate from her parents. And we basically rebooted with a new strategy where we would use technology to not just help supplement our design and supply chain, but it would almost 
define our development process and supply chain. And so with that being said, what changed really for us is that we ended up embracing 3D and technology as a way, as a means of doing product development. And then we used a lot of embedded devices, IoT devices to kind of track and develop our supply chain side. And we used a substantial amount of software for analytics to control our retail and distribution side. And so we try to use every facet that we could and employ different types of people. And so our teams are really focused around technology that enables us to do development and commerce. So I, if, if you were to kind of do in short, our company is more similar to Amazon than it is Nike. Yeah. And the interesting part is it's not, and, and this is, you could have said, hey, we just do the design process and we stop there. Let's just do the design and, and stop there. But in the end, also go the complete way and say, it's, it's not only design. The interesting part is also the complete supply chain handling and managing all the quality steps and the supply steps, which for shoes are not very trivial trivial uh in, right. in that sense and like like you said what i also like is what you said everything or nearly everything you do is made to order which makes it even more complex on that end so it's not just a hey, let's go to stock and and wait until the stuff is sold off or do a fire sale but but being very focused on that that side in built to order specifically especially because our customers are large retailers it's it's very complicated because we have to track every po all the UPCs, the different shipping requirements, all that are necessary to each individual customer. So it takes a, it takes an, an army to actually track everything. And our liability is substantial because let's say if, if a customer ABC can't actually scan the UPC barcode and you made 100,000 units, someone has to sit there and relabel 100,000 units and they're gonna charge you back, I don't know, like two and a half dollars, three dollars per unit. So you're talking about $600,000, all margin, just gone straight out. And being able to have that confidence to guarantee the quality and have the systems checks in place to do business with these large companies means that you have to be able to repeat success. If you don't have the ability to repeat success and production quality, the liability is greater than the opportunity. And let's, let's begin, let's start at the beginning. So um, if you do the design and assemble, mm -hmm. what kind of tools you, I know we talked about RFID, we talked about 3D scanning and, and, and visual components. So what's the, what's the kind of a, a part you use in this, in this field? Oh, so in, in the field, because we deal with women's fashion and I would say a lot of trends, things along those lines, like everything begins, I'd say, with, with a sample, right? Mm -hmm. So my wife and the designers, they're going to go and find inspiration in terms of products that they could possibly find in the marketplace they find like very aspirational so oh i i really love this this very iconic brand and this specific look how can we translate this into something that means something to the masses so it could be where we take and we actually do with uh take a look at the shoe and we'll dissect it to say exactly what's like the best part about this what can we incorporate this into our own design mm -hmm. At that point, what we'll actually do is through the entire development process, very much like um, we use a lot of references from popular consumer software. So my wife's favorite system is Pinterest in terms of like putting together images and collections. So we yeah. put together our, our own type of Pinterest board of all of these different looks from apparel, from footwear, from any type of industry. It could even be from home decoration. We're looking at different prints and materials. How can we incorporate that design and development into our product development cycle? So they'll put together a Pinterest and, board. And I'm sure you did some programming there. So it's not just a normal Pinterest. I'm sure it's something you you, yeah. you also had some 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 influence in. So it's, it's, it's not Pinterest, it's our own internal system that's like Pinterest and we pin items together. So it had to be, oh, it has to be very image friendly, asset friendly, right? And you click on stuff and it's like, oh, I'm going to create my inspiration board here. I'm going to create one for luggage looks. I'm going to create one for like, you know, really dark brand. Like it doesn't matter. The idea behind design is that you want to be able to give them a way to inspire design in a very fast manner. And mm. the faster they could pin, the faster they could be inspired, then the faster you can actually do product development. And that's really the key to it is to give the designers and the people who need to be inspired 
the ability to create as much product with the widest bandwidth as possible. Because eventually you're going to find more, let's say, quality designs through this entire process faster than you can if it's very hampered down and boggled down. Actually, I think this is probably like the, the best way to, to put it. Like I talk about it with a lot of my buyers and teams is that if I were to ask you to cook a stew and I said that you cannot change any of the ingredients until after you taste it, right? And if you could only taste every two weeks, how good is your stew going to be? It's, it's not going to be very good. Yeah. <laughs> but if if you're able to test it as you add ingredients and you're able to try all these different variations from a speed and timing standpoint, then and instantaneous, then your stew is going to be really good because you could adjust to your taste. You're not going to be hampered down by the entire process of these couple of weeks in between. And I would say that systems need to be put in place to expedite design not to boggle down the process. And that's basically kind of like my wife's mandate to me is you better make this easier so I could develop better product. And that, that and, that's basically our core design philosophy. And and the, in, the interesting part is once you have a certain set of designs is how quick can you make it in a real touch and feel manner? Because that's also a differentiator that we see from our side being agile because you can talk a lot about Things you can collect them. You talk about use cases, and then you talk about renderings mm -hmm. and nice pictures. But in the end, um, especially for designers, but also on on the other side, somebody who wants to work with there, say, yeah, how, where does it, how does it feel, how how is that? So it's very much on haptics and and putting in. And I think that's another part to to scale. So one is be quick with ideas, and and uh, and what you told me, you're also very fast to have an output. Yeah, so the, the design process going from concept and ideation to materialization, where you're talking about like an actual physical product is mm -hmm. is pretty fast because we have all these things in place where a shoe, the way it's being made is there's something called a last and it's supposed to be like the shape of your foot. So we already have a digital last library of all the different shoes and designs that we could actually use and potentially it's like a framework, a template that you might want to use on that specific shoe. And as we begin the entire design process, if we actually like a specific design, then the designers will actually use in 3D software, they actually draw all the shoes through a styling standpoint on top of the last and will develop out the 3D model. On the 3D model, we have special software that we purchased where it'll take the 3D model and it'll flatten it into the pattern pieces. So that means that someone can actually go through and cut the materials to actually be able to create the shoe. The first part that's pretty neat is that we actually have a custom software platform and hardware platform where we scan in all different types of materials. And so as we're doing the 3D design, we can pick and choose actually all the materials on top of the shoe. So we could visually see what the shoe combinations are in advance before a physical prototype is actually made. So this kind of goes back to my original analogy of the stew. If we can change and add more pepper or more salt to our stew in a short time period, then how good is the stew going to be? The same thing goes for line building and product development. If we can actually change the color variations and materials and iterations to find the best combination possible, we're going to have better product in a very shorter span of time before a physical product is made. For us to use a 3D software, which is on the web platform to actually take a look at the physical design, it's a matter of seconds. Like I could change, oh, I want to change the upper to zebra. I want to change the specific side panel to leopard. And I could see exactly what the shoe looks like in a very short span of time. And I can come up with the entire color collection in a matter of 10 minutes. If I were to do the exact same in a physical sample standpoint, I would have to wait potentially weeks for the entire collection to be created and curated in advance. And so that's kind of like where the 3D software comes into play. The second part that's really important is that the, all the material suppliers that we had actually vetted and sourced into our scan material database, they have access to our systems also. So if we create a sample order after the, the virtual one is created, let's say that we want to actually create the physical prototype then the designers and line builder, they're going to add it into the shopping cart. And they they love it because it's like a way of, they it's like Amazon. They're going to go online and they're going to go shopping. They're going to say, oh, I like this virtual sample. Click, click, 
click and they add it to the shopping cart and they go through the entire checkout process because it's so simple and it's similar to what they do on a day to day basis, then it's actually very intuitive for them to actually check out. And the more important thing is that we actually built out the software to have the supply chain system to handle the fulfillment side. It's like eBay. If you use eBay, you only have the buyer side portal, but you don't have the seller side portal. It's not going to work because it's very self-centric. eBay is a marketplace because you can actually handle the supply side. So we built all the software portal and everything in place for the sample room and also the component supplier to say, I received the sample in this specific canvas material that's camo, and they're going to send it over to our factory and they're going to actually produce the sample. So the lead time for us to produce a product is a matter of days and we'll actually take a look at the physical sample in a very short time period with a limited collection because we've already curated from the virtual of maybe 100 potential combinations down to the 20 best ones. And from the 20 best ones, all the suppliers were immediately notified that they had to provide all the raw materials. It didn't have to go through a secondary person. The moment the line builder added everything into the shopping cart and checked out. So, it's, I mean, that in short is basically how we heard all the different parties in but place. That's, that's amazing if you, like, in a sense saying 20 physical samples per order, that's a volume. I mean, that's that's something uh, you and, and especially in that time frame. I, I personally know that that process designer and sample from the furniture industry. And that was always interesting because it takes a long time to build furniture. So it's not that fast. And in the end, there could be a gap in between that where maybe the designer changes his mind because the frozen zone, in a sense, is mm -hmm. very difficult to hold for design processes. But in that process that you described, the frozen zone is actually more or less zero and all the requirements are integrated from the um, the sample or the, the, the supply side and from the customer side. Yep, absolutely. And so, the, I mean, there's, there's so many different angles to it. And then there's also like after the physical sample is, is created, certain companies, they still have to like typically they want to send the samples back or photography has to be a certain way. Um, I, I was previewed to some really, really cool technology when I was at Disney because Steve Jobs was involved in the process. And so at the time, Apple had created something called QuickTime VR. And it, it, it was crazy. They had this entire humongous cage that was like the size of a car. And they would put a DSLR camera on top and they would take photos from multiple angles. And then they would use the QuickTime VR software to actually capture and do something called a virtual stitch they'd stitch yeah. it together. So this is like, oh my gosh, I'm, I feel really old 80s, now. 80s, Over 20, 80s. Nah, no, it was not 80s. It was late 90s. It was after he came back to take over Apple again. And so he started taking a lot of the Apple ideas and concepts and he, he brought it in. Um, and we, we did the same thing too, where rather than having a specific angle, like for a cage to take photo shots of all the consumer products, what we did is we put our shoes in the center of a turntable we have a DSLR camera set up at an angle, and then the turntable will be integrated into an IoT device and a Raspberry Pi device where it actually turn the, the turntable itself. The DSLR camera would actually take the photos and then it stitched all the images together. And so we put together the, the actual turntable itself, the motor, the stepper motor, everything in between, as well as the Raspberry Pi. And then we also wrote all the software alongside to kind of coordinate the entire action of turn photo stitch after everything's completed and then upload everything back to the cloud it, it's it's fantastic what you can do with raspberry pis nowadays it's really that's that's amazing yeah but yeah, the, yeah, yeah. maybe it's maybe neat. one but do you, is it really i mean but that's that's only when when i look at renderings coming from from our company here on the on the b2b side most of or some renderings really look real do you really need photos? I mean, do you need the physical product or could you do, because if you talk about VR and let's say putting shoes on somebody's foot in a VR setting, would you really need the physical product or could you just do it out of the rendering? I, I, I don't think that we can do it out of the rendering by itself because women and 
shoes, the, the fitting is so tight. It's a very tactile product in itself, unless it's like a like a small minor change and update. If you're talking about new product, I, I would say that it's exact opposite. I don't care to get as close as possible to like 100% or 99% for the rendering. What I really care about is getting to the 80%, like good enough so that we can kind of see what it virtually looks like to make the judgment to see if it should be included to, to be prototyped or not. Does this physical sample, I mean, does this virtual sample actually have the ability to make it to the line? If it doesn't have the ability to make it to the line, don't even bother making the physical sample. That way we mm -hmm. reduce our carbon footprint. We reduce like the amount of labor that's allocated to product development. So we were able to reduce a lot of our R&D costs purely by being able to cut out that 20% that does not actually belong in the line. And the more that we can increase the number of drops and focus on the good things, then it really helped us focus on the products that we really wanted to sell. The one thing about women's footwear and also just like apparel products is that the hand touch is so important because it's going to define, is a boot going to stand up straight? Is it going to kind of curve? Is it going to be supposed to be floppy or slouchy because it has all these different characteristics? And the other aspect is from a fitting standpoint, is it going to fit a wide foot? Is it going to fit a very narrow foot? The fitting itself is down to the millimeter and also the amount of pressure that's used to pull the upper material on top of the last is different. And so those are some of the aspects of why we actually have to make the physical shoe after we go through the virtual design in order to actually see if it fits the needs of the marketplace. That's something something we didn't talk about, but what I just, just want to add or make a small excursion. So. If in the design process you you say hey this is for a small foot with this setting and it's very mm -hmm. exact, so wouldn't that be amazing on the consumer side for a woman with a with a very small feet with certain settings or with me with who has a little mm -hmm. bit wider feet to exactly have this tags or this information when I sec select shoes? So this is an information which could be given or could be added on, on each model, which I don't see done a lot if I go into e-commerce at the moment. Uh, well, uh, unfortunately, you're a man. And so <laughs> your market in terms of the value as a consumer is kind of small, relatively speaking. Women, they, they buy a lot more shoes than men. Women drive the economy. And so women, they do. They have like wide, they have narrow, they have medium, they have wide calf, they have narrow calf. They have all different sizes that are actually marked off. Like a lot of retailers now will specifically call out depending on the volume. If you're talking about like high end, like maybe Christian Louboutin or something along those lines, they're not going to. They, they just tell you to suffer because fashion hurts like women suffer to look good and that's so true especially in shoes i i can't emphasize that enough but if you come down to something that's closer to mass market because the volume is so large and the molds are easier to amortize and they'll definitely call it out specifically to say hey this is more of a wide width this is a medium width joseph you don't buy enough shoes so they're not going to call it out for you buy more <laughs> I give a call to Birkenstock. <laughs> no, but but the, 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 the interesting part is if you, if you have, um, let's say, the 3D model and let's say everybody has a smartphone, cameras are getting better, what mm -hmm. if you scan your foot and have a, a complete model of your foot that you could then give back to the manufacturer in that sense? To say, okay, please select me the best fitting shoe based on my three D three data because the three D data is readily available, is in a database, and could be <laughs> let's say measured to my. So I have I have a mass product in a sense, but I have mm -hmm. a customized solution. Okay, so this is this is a very fascinating conversation. So th there's there's three different components that have to actually happen to make that work. In a utopian model, yes, that would work perfectly, right? Yeah. But the, the first problem is that means all the manufacturers have to actually have 3D in place. So they have to mm -hmm. have a substantial database. Second part is like the places that you would shop, they would have to actually be able to incorporate and include all that information, which manufacturers typically will not release either because the exact measurements are something that they hold potentially proprietary. 
And then the third part is that they actually have to have the software built in on the retail side to be able to match and capture it and compare. And that's actually pretty expensive to actually, if, from a computing standpoint, to go through, which is, I, I think it's very doable. But that means the retailer has to have the ability for the algorithms to do the comparison against the 3D model. And then the manufacturers have to be sophisticated enough to design in 3D and actually go through the entire production and fitting process in 3D and to give all of those measurements back to the retailer on a standardized platform for them to actually communicate. And that that takes a lot of time. I think the only way that could actually happen is if you're talking about vertical integration where a single brand is selling it through their own platform and their own platform is handling the measurement, then I think that would work. If you're talking about a marketplace, then I think that's very difficult. I mean, we I, I brought it up because we actually did some projects in the past, which sadly were all not very successful. They were all, let's say, in a prototype or pilot stage with several big brands to do 3D uh, measurement of their feed in the store uh, with those devices. So having a, a camera and, and, and a solution to get the complete uh, consumer foot done and then send it back. But it, like you said, it didn't work because they didn't have the database. So they couldn't uh, generate enough, um, <laughs> enough feedback. So it all died down. Again, was in a sense efficient, but the customer journey was crappy because you only get a few selected shoes out of that. But that's, yeah, that, that's not, and it was a physical, you needed to go in the shop to do that. And I'm, I know that Foot Locker is doing, uh, for example, some, some, some things in that or have, has been doing that in the past as well with the running shoes, um, mm -hmm. but also not that, uh, I wouldn't say that system systemically over the um, complete supply chain because they just didn't have the data. Like I said, it needs to be vertically integrated. But that could it, be it definitely that, has to be vertical. That, that could be something you can do. <laughs> yeah, that, that can be something that, that we could do. But un unfortunately, so much of our business right now is wholesale. So you, you're talking about to a marketplace like a retailer, like let's say Belk yeah. or Famous Footwear or shoe carnival where they carry multiple brands. And so they're not gonna make the infrastructure change. If it's purely for my company in terms of direct to consumer and we have a retail front, then we could definitely do that. Like, you know, a company that could pop, could do what you're talking about very easily would be Allbirds. Allbirds yeah. is like the brand, they're the retailer, the manufacturer, like they, they, as a vertically integrated distribution point, then you can do so. Yeah, that's an interesting, so let's, Let's let's go back from from uh, let's say consumer view. Let's go into supply chain side because uh, we're already nearly at thirty minutes, so <laughs> we didn't even cover the <laughs> the production part. But but actually, what I found found interesting when you explained, okay, this is how the prototype is done and the design samples. But then going back to the production side and really having that same systematic approach to say we want to have a controlled quality. We want to have the same materials and to keep it all in check because this is a long supply chain, very multi-tier supply chain with all mm -hmm. kinds of different parts, which then need to be put together, packaged, sent over large shipments. So there's not no room for error in, in that, that side. And again, technology is an, a big factor in that. Yeah, so for us, it's, it's really important because our procurement system, basically, if someone adds or we receive an order and we're cutting the order, then the bill of material, because on the design side, we actually specified all the individual components. The raw material suppliers actually have access to our system and they will receive the purchase order alongside with the consumption and demand plan. So if, Joseph, you're a shoelace supplier, you're going to see shoelaces for 100,000 units. And then the factory, you're expecting an order from the factory. So that way, you know that you're expecting an order and the factory is held liable to actually go through and order directly from you. We have QC teams in place where they're actually going to be receiving the shoelaces or the upper material, whatever component it might be, and they're going to compare it against the original sample also. So we put together entire full tech kits and SOPs in place where they can actually compare it. And then they have a cell phone app that they actually take photos and they have to upload. It automatically uploads back to the cloud against the production run. So we basically have an entire team and army in all the respective factories and then we have production managers 
throughout the globe that don't have to physically be there that can actually see the assets and the comparison between the original versus like production in itself. And so that way we kind of run this entire process to guarantee quality. And real time. So I think that, that the yeah. part is it's it's in a in a real time setting. It's not mm -hmm. I receive papers with some photos and some oh, no, no. Like <laughs> examples uh, three weeks after uh, and uh, like everything is already shitty. Yeah? Because no, it was the wrong color or, or something didn't match. Yeah? No, we're, we're talking about within seconds. So by the time it, it takes the phone and there's cell phone signal, 4G, it gets uploaded and we're talking about close to real-time synchronization. So everything is on spot yeah. point where we can make changes in, in mid-production or pre-production. Yeah, and and may, maybe one one time or one thing that we, we said before what it was, um, and you also said, uh, saving um waste so not generating mm -hmm. waste and and trying yeah. to be low carbon because once you set that supply chain and once you have the control you also have a very good view on what is spent on that and what what materials are in there so you have a very good reference for the retail and for the customer if it what's my carbon footprint uh how much waste was included what was the material is it recycled material or is it new material so you have a very good picture that you could give also to con to the consumer. Yeah, for sure. I mean, if we if we have a reference library and it's going to be, let's say, all of these material suppliers who have a much smaller carbon footprint or they have the BCSI certification and the designers are picking and choosing using these specific suppliers, then these suppliers are also the ones that are pre-vetted that are going to receive the order and they know that they receive the purchase order from us as well. So we don't go through any middleman to actually cut the purchase order. We do it directly ourselves to the component suppliers as well. So they're expecting the purchase order. And then that way they're going to give the certification back to the factory and they give us a copy as well for all production purposes. So that way everybody is actually going back to the thread source instead or the component source. If you can't audit all the way back down to the original component supplier, then how good is your supply chain going to be unless you can get to the raw material component supplier? And yeah, that's that, essentially the most important aspect of it. Yeah, that's the, that's the secret sauce. And that's about like vertical integration in a sense, because if, if you're a retailer in the future, retailer or brand in the future, I think having that vertical transparency will be imminent if you want to have your brand image or if you want to cater to your customers because that will be something either if it's tax if it's tax issues or government issues that will put a price on it or like special taxes or if it's just something that's on the consciousness side very important to know where wh where is it done what did it what's the impact on that so all that information is is interesting yeah yeah, it's, it's, and it's much easier, actually, if you do it from the design side, because if we begin the design cycle from the bill of material, we're already defining the component supplier, then it's not like when we receive the order, we're chasing down the production, we have to find suppliers and copy it. That's, that's going to be way too much after the fact, because we start from concept and inception, it's so much easier on the front side. So that's why it's important to equip our designers with these tools in place to make it as seamless and integrated as possible for us to take that next step afterwards to make it smooth for production. Very cool. So I, I think we, we, we already um, are five minutes over. Maybe um, somebody wants to ask a question. There are no, no questions asked uh, until now. Maybe we, everybody's frightened, frightened off. So if you have some questions, uh, do not hesitate to to post. Um, otherwise, we we will wrap up um, the uh, the show. And uh, thanks a lot, Michael. I mean, from my side, I, I really love this conversation. Uh, shoes is just it's just amazing, and getting the technology side on that because in the end, that's what makes efficiencies and makes things more. Yeah, more doable and more economical in in the future. So, it has been it has been a real real pleasure. Well, thank you for having me. I I, I think rarely, typically, do operations and tech guys have the opportunity to platform. It's usually the design side. It's the beauty side. So, 
for this time, <laughs> the, the geek gets to represent as opposed to the beauty side. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Okay. Thanks a lot. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a good one.